Hey everyone, thank you for tuning in to NJ's Choice 2020. I'm AJ Malillo, as you know, and of course I'm here with Lewis Beyond Alillo. But Lewis, we have a very important and special guest today, don't we? We definitely do. This is Congresswoman Mikey Sherrill. Thank you for being with us, Mikey. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. I know, Lewis, me and you have both had the, the pleasure of interviewing Mikey in the past, and she's a great interviewer, and we're super excited that you are able to join us again today, Mikey. So thank you again. Um, but really, so to start off with this interview, and this is a, a pretty basic question, but for those of you, of you listeners that don't know, um, Mikey, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, who you are, why you decided to run for Congress in 2018, and now you're running for re-election in 2020. So, so why are you running and, and who, who is Mikey Sherrill? <laughs> um, I feel like I'm on kind of the psychiatric couch. Who is Mikey Sherrill? Um, no, I, uh, I decided to run. It's something that um, I didn't think I would do. And, and I might have told you guys the story uh, last cycle, but I, you know, I started tossing around this idea of feeling like I had to run, that there were so many concerns I had for myself and the future and my children. That I had to run, and and I thought um, that I would go talk to my husband about it, and he would convince me that that was a really crazy idea. That he would be like, "We've got four kids. We live in New Jersey. You know, what are you doing commuting to Washington? How's that going to work?" And so I went up to him and I said, um, "Jason, uh, you know, I think I have to run for Congress." And he goes. Yeah, yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah, you should do that. And to this day, I'm not really sure why he said that. I'm sure there's days where he wonders why he said that. But um, but it just sort of cemented all the things that I was concerned about. Um, that, you know, just after having served this country for most of my adult life, um, I I deeply believe in the values of this country. I um. I was just reminiscing about entering the Naval Academy. I entered just, it was just the 30th anniversary of I Day, induction day at the Naval Academy on July 3rd, 1990 for me. And so um, I was thinking back on that and summer in Annapolis is a, a balmy 90 degrees and 100% humidity and I'm running around the yard and I'm getting yelled at. And, you know, people are sending me postcards from the shore because back then we didn't have email, you know, <laughs> so they're really living it up. And I just felt so incredibly lucky to be there, to be part of something bigger, to, to feel like I was joining a group of people that were going to stand up for the country, to protect our values and to protect the people of this country. And I think this drive, this drive to, to protect our country, to, to believe in our values is shared by so many people. And what's amazing to me when I look at the people that have made sacrifices, sometimes that, you know, the cost of their lives for this country, so many of them didn't even have the full protection of our laws. You know, when you hear story, you hear stories that in Texas, German POWs were treated better than black soldiers. I can tell you when I entered the Naval Academy, most of the, the jobs in the military, jobs that led to promotions and that would have led to leadership in the Navy weren't open to women. So, you know, why do people do that? Why would people enter the military? And, and I would posit it's not because the suckers or losers, that's not certainly how I felt when I went to the Naval Academy, but rather because we believe we can make it better. We think we can make this country a better place, a more perfect union. And so black people didn't go into the military because they, they thought the status quo in world, during World War II was just fine. They went because they thought that this country could do better and would do better. And that's why I ran for Congress. That's why I'm running for Congress again, because this constant drive to make this country a better place and certainly I think I've always felt that way, but now with four kids, I, you know, kind of double down on, on the fact that we really need to have this, this bright future um, for our kids and continue to invest in the country and the ideals of the country and making it a better place. You mentioned several times uh, values of this country and ideals of this country. In this divided country that we live in, especially 2020, it's from the last time we met, it's gotten worse in my opinion. What are the values of this country? What do the American people believe? And how do we get to those values? How do we accurately create that country? 
Well, I think the values of this country are, are the values that our founding fathers put out and this idea that in a democracy, when you have citizens that are engaged in government, that you're putting a lot of responsibility in so many people. So you have to come together as a community to fight for your beliefs. And so together, when we are a unified country, that's where our strength is. Um, and it has to be in a democracy. You know, there are several ways to run a country. And certainly if you're gonna run a dictatorship, there's only really one person that I think has to decide what to do. But in a democracy, we have to come together. And, and as you've mentioned, um, we're very, it feels very divided right now. Um, and yet, to me, the sad part about a lot of these divisions is that so many people agree deeply with the values of the country, um, but they, they're scared and they're afraid. And, they're, and I guess what really upsets me is this, this division because people have sort of given up. Um, they've given up on this idea that if we come together, if we keep investing in justice and civil rights, if we keep investing in making sure that um, everyone in the economy is lifted up, if we keep investing in the middle class and pathways into the middle class, that that makes us stronger. And instead, they've started to feel, and I think, you know, quite frankly, I think a lot of this is driven by the president. They've started to feel that government doesn't work for them. So they've just got to, to take everything they can get for themselves and not worry about the rest of the community. So, if, you know, don't worry about the elderly or the vulnerable people in the community. If you don't want to wear a mask, that's your right. Don't wear a mask. Or if you're white, don't worry about black people. Or if, you know, the stock market's really on fire, um, but other people across the country are really suffering economically, don't worry about that. Because you know what? Even though you care about that stuff, government can't do anything about it anyway. So you're just going to have to look out for number one. And I think that is such a false precept. I think when it functions effectively, and this is why I'm doing what I'm doing, government can be a force for good. Government, it, it can't do everything, and there's some areas where it can't do things very well. But there are other areas where an engaged government with good policies can really make a huge difference in people's lives across the country. And that's that faith. I think there, I think there's a real loss in faith. And I wouldn't just put that down to this administration. I think this has been building. Um, and, I, and I'll tell you, some of it, we've made a reality in government. So for example, underfunding the IRS for many, many years has led to an IRS that is using the cobalt system, which is from the 60s. And when we as Congress needed to push money into the economy very, very quickly with direct checks and stabilization funds, it, it was a broken system that, that you know, was very hard to work with and very hard to come up with a plan to do that. So in some cases, even we in government need to have more faith in our institutions and fund them better for efficiency and so that they can work better for the American people. Yeah, Mikey, uh, thank you so much for that answer. It, I think we're getting a bit of an echo right now. I'm not too sure. Oh, here, I can put myself on mute. Okay. Um, so thank you so much for that answer. And, and a lot of it, you know, I can honestly say I, I couldn't agree more uh, with a lot of what you said. But um, my question is, how exactly so when you were running the first time, and we had an interview with you, then you had promised to, to work on um, unity in the in the country. And it's clearly, I mean, not your fault at all, as as a freshman Congresswoman that we're so polarized as we are today. But what exactly are your plans to start to help fix the polarization? You talked a little bit about that in your last question, but what are concrete things and steps that you can do as one Congresswoman from New Jersey to help with this divide? You're still on mute, Mikey. <laughs> you would think, I, I feel like in the Navy, you always got patches for like a thousand hours flying and stuff like that. I feel like I should have like a thousand hour Zoom patch, but even despite that, I'm still leaving myself on mute. Um, so, you know, the majority, I, I think even though maybe I can't single-handedly solve this problem, I think I have a responsibility. 
I, I tend to think everybody in a democracy has a responsibility to address the problems of government. Um, but especially as a member of Congress, there are things I can do and have been doing. So um, I've joined the bipartisan Four Country Caucus. We started that this year. It's a bipartisan group of veterans from both sides of the aisle. The majority of the work I do in Congress is bipartisan. So for example, I put together, when I heard at a, um, I, I was uh, hearing about a gentleman who didn't have enough money, he had PTSD that dated back to Vietnam and has impacted his entire life just about um, and couldn't afford a service dog in the firehouse um, the fire union put together money so they could get him a service dog. Uh, I, I worked with Rep Stiers from um, Ohio to put together, he had the PAWS Act and I worked to get Democrats on the PAWS Act so we could pass that through the house um, to get veteran service dogs. The Great American Outdoors Act, which impacts things like um, the Great Swamp, the Morristown Historical Society, um, moving, you know, some of the great places in our district and across America. That was incredibly bipartisan. I helped lead that through the House of Representatives. It was passed in the House, the Senate signed into law by the President. Um, even now, as we're trying to look for pathways to get to um, a deal with the coronavirus legislation, you see so many members in the House working together, trying to push something out that, that will be taken up in the Senate. So recently there were, I think about 12 Republicans and 12 Democrats on a bill, a compromise bill, um, to try to continue, all, all from the House, to try to continue to push that. So there are many people that like myself believe in bipartisanship, don't have to say that something that they passed is a win for the Democrats or a win for the Republicans, as long as it's a win for the country. And I think, I'll tell you, um, throughout this, the coronavirus pandemic, I've been working with Democrats and Republicans from all over. So I started the Northeast Regional Recovery Task Force with Representative Pete King from Long Island, a Republican from Long Island. Democrats and Republicans just looking at how we can get people back to work in the Northeast region, how we safely do that. Um, I've been working with Democrats and Republicans throughout the 11th district. And that's, I, I have to say, no matter what your political background is, that's what so many people want to see because they want to know that in a time of crisis, we can come together and work for people. That, that I'm not sitting in my, you know, I'm not sitting in my house on all my constant Zoom calls thinking to myself, gosh, this, this coronavirus, how can I use this to do X or use this to do Y? They want to see and they want to know that all I'm doing is thinking every day about how can I get our kids back to school? How can I get people back to work? How can I get the economy open? How can I do so safely and make sure not one more person dies from coronavirus? You know, to model that I think is really important, even if I, I, um, I, I would be lying if I said I thought I could single-handedly wipe this out. Um, but I do think I have um, a responsibility to work as hard as I can to model bipartisanship and to, to do that because I promised to do that for the community. So thank you for that, first of all. Um, and I don't know if you remember this, but when we met two years ago, I told you that I was a freshman in college and you were then a freshman in Congress. A lot has changed for me in terms of my political beliefs in those past two years. What's something that you believe in now that maybe you didn't believe in two years ago? Oh, that's a great, great question. Um, I, gosh, I think so many of the things that I ran on, um, I believe, but it's different than I thought it would be. Bipartisanship is different than I thought it would be. And so I believe very deeply in bipartisanship and I just kind of laid out for you some of the work that I've been doing. Um, but, I, uh, but I know it's, it's some of the broader things are harder. It, it's, and, and some of the, the ways the House is set up, the ways the Senate is set up has, have made it kind of harder to do some of the big work that we're gonna to need to do on infrastructure, for example. Um, and one of the things that I guess I've, I've changed my view on um, has, has been healthcare. Um, I had hoped we could build after, and 
in after you know we did the Affordable Care Act, and then we had I don't know I don't remember how many um, you know dozens and dozens and dozens of bills from the Republican Party trying to get rid of the Affordable Care Act, and I had hoped that in this cycle, since that was over, and I, I I've talked to a lot of Republicans. I think a lot of Republicans deeply believe we need to fix the health care system. I had hoped we could come together in a broad bipartisan effort. I think um, that has not happened. And, um, and I think we need to move forward in every way, shape, or form that we can to provide better health care to Americans. And I am thinking now, after the pandemic, even more broadly than probably I was in my last election, we have got to have everyone covered. We've got to make sure that they can afford that coverage. Um, the cost to this economy and to society and just to individuals and families of the coronavirus because we have not had people getting good health care, the loss of life because people didn't have access to preventative care and so had underlying health conditions that made them susceptible um, to coronavirus in a way other people weren't and then dying from it in, at rates other people weren't. We look at um, how coronavirus has affected minority communities in a way that it hasn't affected other communities has, I think, just really highlighted for me. I had already felt like it was a deep need in the country, but I think we have got to do, um, we've got to move at a faster rate and we've got to, I think, consider even broader ways of getting people covered. Um, and that's changed. I, I thought we could just move forward with the Affordable Care Act and protecting it and slowly build on it. Um, I am, I, I'm thinking now just with how horrible this pandemic has been, the urgency for me um, to ensure that, that we get better coverage has opened up. I, I'm willing to talk about, you know, you name a good idea that we can get coverage to people um, and, and impact uh, our healthcare system, I'm ready to sit down and talk. It's just, um, it's been striking to me. How poor, I think we always heard it and we knew it. We knew that our healthcare wasn't as good as across the world, but right at the beginning of the pandemic, people say, why can't we be like Sweden? You know, they haven't closed. Why can't we be like Sweden? And, and for many, many reasons, but one of the reasons is because our country's not nearly as healthy as Sweden. I mean, we are just not a healthy country and we pay an incredible amount of, of money to, be, to have kind of average or below average health. And, and that's not acceptable. Congresswoman Cheryl, uh, thank you so much again for being with us. And um, the, unfortunately, we're running out of time. So oh, uh, that went fast. Yes. So I, I have two more questions for you. Lewis is going to ask one. I'm going to ask one. And I would have loved to to keep going with with what we were talking about before, but we have to switch topics. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention the deal that the Trump administration just did with Bahrain and the UAE and Israel. And I would like to hear what your thoughts on that deal briefly are. Um, is this something, although you are not uh, a major supporter of the president, is this something that you believe the president has done well and you hope to see more of? Yes, yeah, I, um, I'll tell you, I studied in Egypt for a semester. Um, 